Hello, welcome to the Voices from Broadway series from Broadway Teachers Workshop. Nice to have you all with me on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon in New York City. Uh, hope wherever you are, you are safe and healthy and that your families are safe and healthy. Um, uh, please say hello, let me know where you are, where you're watching from, uh, and hope you're all doing well. My name is Ian Weinberger. I am the music director of Hamilton on Broadway. Uh, which uh, is a dream gig, it's a ton of fun, uh, and I've been with the show for about five years now since the Off-Broadway production at the Public Theater. Um, but I also work as a teaching artist for Broadway Teachers Workshop, which is so much fun. Uh, I'm, I'm always so energized, so excited by and inspired by the teachers, educators uh, that I get to meet and work with through the Broadway Teachers Workshop and by extension through their students who I meet through the student event, which is the Broadway Student Summit. I get to work with students and their teachers and um, from, from all over the country and the world a number of times a year, which is such a blast to be with them. Uh, so it's a blast to be with you digitally today, which is the next best thing. And thank you for, for tuning in. Um, hello from all over the world. What a, what a thrill. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for saying so. Um, so it obviously is a bit of a strange time for all of us, and we're, uh, uh, I, I know that all of your schools or your workplaces have been totally disrupted uh, by, by all of this, as have ours here in New York. So I wanted to give you something to spark some creativity and spark some joy uh, in the midst of trying to probably come up with new ways of teaching and learning in the midst of all of this. So this is a short 30-minute little presentation workshop on teaching theater music remotely, um, which we'll get more to in a second, or maybe just a couple of ideas for teaching uh, in this new climate and teaching music for theater specifically. Um, feel free to type in some comments or, or some questions specifically as, as we go. Um, the the uh, essentially two parts to this, there'll be sort of like part A and part B, and in the, maybe in between, I'll sort of grab a couple questions that have come up along the way before we move on to part B, and then maybe I'll save some more for the end. So feel free to like type in some questions and forgive me while I sort of like sit here and scroll and like pick a couple to answer. But if anything comes up or if there's anything you want to ask about, go ahead and drop it in. Um, so teaching, you know, theater music remotely, I want to say right off the bat that I am no expert <laughs> in this whatsoever. We're all sort of uh, making this up absolutely as it happens, because I don't know that any of us have had to do anything like this before, have had to teach or learn or work on something artistically entirely in a remote setting. Um, I'm sure there are people that have, I know, you know, voice coaches have done things remotely and things like that, but to try to teach something to a larger group or, or on a more larger scale, I'm sure we're all sort of figuring out. And so uh, I, I said this to a friend of mine that I was teaching a class on this and he actually laughed in my face. The idea being that like, I'm no expert in this. It's not as though I have been studying you know, remote teaching techniques for the for years and years, and now I'm like, yes, this is my moment. It's not like that at all, but it's simply that in the last several weeks, talking with educators and artists and directors and music directors all over the country and a little bit internationally, like I've uh, collected some thoughts and collected a couple of ideas about what might be useful. Um, so this is uh, uh, just to acknowledge that we're all sort of like throwing spaghetti on the wall together all over the world right now and to sort of see what sticks and see what might be useful. So here's just a couple of ideas um, that might be useful in your classrooms with your students. Uh, feel free to steal them and rework them or to use little snippets of it uh, and see what, what might be good or as sort of building blocks and jumping off points for your students as you sort of try to come up with curricula or activities um, that could be used for the rest of your school year or the summer and beyond. So the big idea that I want to talk about is what it might be like to learn and work on songs from home if you're a student. And uh, if you're, for instance, a teacher that had a curriculum about uh, perhaps you had choir songs that you wanted to work on, or if maybe there was going to be a spring musical, or maybe you've got a class of theater kids that maybe it's about uh, assigning specific songs to each individual student that maybe they want to work on at home, or maybe even a duet that a couple of people could work on together. And maybe it's that, uh, uh, 
the you know if the teacher is able to provide them with an accompaniment track or a karaoke track or maybe even that if you have a student who plays piano or guitar or something they might be able to make their own um like i say many different ways to sort of approach this but the idea is what might happen if you ask a student to work on a song at home on their own or in a very small group and really sort of study them and really get into what the meat of the song is and really learn it sort of the way the pros do, the way we ask a professional actor to sort of like learn a song, take it home, do a ton of studying and sort of character work and sort of learning it on their own before coming into perhaps the next rehearsal or the staging rehearsal to sort of work on it that way. So here's a couple of things that we might be able to ask our students to do uh, without us being there all the time. So, uh, it could be for performance if it like I say if there's a track available uh, to perform perhaps for you or or for the class or it could just be for the sake of studying something or getting maybe maybe it's a song they already know and maybe here's a couple of ways to get into it in a different in a different way. Oh hi from Chicago, my hometown. Nice to see you. Three one two. Okay, so here's a couple of things. Uh, like I say, we're gonna sort of do this in two parts. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is about lyrics and text and getting into the sort of meaning of things. And uh, any actor who's worked with me uh, before sort of knows that my, the way I sort of approach music directing has a lot to do with words and has a lot to do with uh, uh, why we say what we say. And uh, I think one of the many things to think about is that especially with young students and people who are still learning, and for that matter, any of us, I think we, get into a, a, a little bit of a trap sometimes where we think that we've sung all the notes and rhythms and we've learned the song and that's it. And that's great. And I, I sounded really good on my high B or whatever it might be. Um, and what I always try to remember for myself and for the people I work with is that, as it now says, oh, thank you, Gordon, um, that uh, notes and rhythms are step one. And learning the song and learning our way around and getting all the words in the right order and singing all the notes and putting them in a really good placement and making them sound great are Evanston, Illinois. Oh, I'm sorry for the interruption. My hometown, my actual hometown. Okay, now I'm back, 847. Um, so, uh, but that's really only the beginning of learning it, is that now we've, we've really only set the baseline is once we've quote unquote learned the song and learned how it goes. And I think for many young students that I've met and that I've worked with, that seems to be the place that we come from when we perform is that I learned the song, I can sing the whole thing. And that's great, but I want to now encourage us to like make that the beginning of our study rather than the finish. So the things we think about in terms of lyrics, and a couple of examples I'll throw in along the way. Um, sort of first thought is always to think about uh, we want to internalize the meaning as much as we can. The sort of like the, the the meaning of the words we're saying, which sounds very basic and sounds very obvious almost, but we really want to think about. Uh, 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 words alone and what it is that the words are trying to get across, right? So uh, it could be, for instance, uh, you know, here's a dumb example from Hamilton, which is silence, a message from the king, a message from the king. Okay, make it very readable. A message from the king can be really, uh, oh my God, are we scared of the king? Are we excited about the king? Do we fight for the king? Whatever it might be, even in that little snippet, a message, ooh, maybe we don't get a message that often. Maybe it's gonna be really scary for us to hear. Even an oohs or ahs or something backgroundy has um has has a purpose and has a has has something that we want to look for and what's the story that we're trying to tell. Yes, exactly. Somebody put puts in there tell the story. It sounds very basic, but I think often in learning notes and rhythms, we can almost lose sight of that sometimes. And so number one priority has to be what is the story we're trying to tell line by line and what is the what is the message we're trying to convey um oh yes tell the story with an exclamation point thank you gordon well done um unless that's mary we have all sorts of staff here at broadway teachers workshop okay so oohs and ahs internalizing the lyric meaning whatever it may be and then we want to find the operative and the active words as much as possible um so, you know for instance uh uh thing like um, I love the idea of, I don't know, uh, first thing that comes to mind, because on my outline is legal bond. I'll be there on Monday, nine o'clock, right? My sister will love that. Uh, what is it, what, what the operative word might be is, I'll be there on Monday, or I'll be there on Monday, uh, whatever it might be. And there's usually not a wrong answer. Uh, 
you know, I would vote maybe not for the word on. I'll be there on Monday. Probably not the choice, but by and large, it will become apparent to us what the where the meaning wants to land, or I often use the word underline. Can you underline that word for me? Um, and it's fun to try a few versions and see what we like. This might be a fun sidebar for a student to see in any lyric in the song, how many different ways can you say it? How many different ways can you sing it? And how many different subtext meanings can we get out of it? Um, in the same song, I'm thinking about, I am so much better. What's amazing about that is that it's useful because it gets repeated so many times. I am so much better. I'm so much better. I'm so much better. Whatever it might be, there are probably many, many different ways, especially if we sing it many times, to think about that. And maybe there's a really good exercise of how many different ways can we find to sing it? And maybe what are our favorite ones? And what are, what are the ones that are the most impactful? Could also be a fun exercise to uh, do an internet deep dive because now we have the internet and the internet exists. How many different uh, how many different takes on this chorus can we find out there in the ether of YouTube? How many different ways can we find that people do it? Um, and that might be a really, really interesting way. Yes, repeated in 4,000 different keys. Could be, exactly right. Um, so yes, repeated phrases are useful. Sometimes in terms of operative and active words, sometimes the line of the song does the work for you. Um, what comes to mind is, uh, is see the line where the sky meets the sea, talking about Moana, uh, uh, on the beats and on the top notes of the line, he put it right there for me. See the line where the sky meets the sea, it calls me, he puts it right there in the line for us. And sometimes it's handed to us on the silver platter that way. Um, another one that comes to mind is, I really need this job, please God, I need this job. It's right there. And maybe we don't need to do any extra looking for us, but we wanna know that it's there. And do you see how much more interesting and how much more important for me to underline, um, I really need this job versus I really need this job is a pretty way to sing it, but it has no um, urgency for me. It has no stakes, right? So we want to really underline the things that are important. One of my favorite things to do in terms of looking for meaning in a lyric, looking as if sometimes we don't have to look, but sometimes in terms of finding it or, or activating it, is I often use the opposite meaning of the words just as a little test. Um, for instance, uh, some of you have, have done the Broadway teacher workshop with me where I teach the song All the Live Long Day from working. And one of the things that, that comes to mind in that song is the line, uh, pay me a million dollars to tell you what I do at the store. So if, if we were to imagine pay me five or six dollars versus pay me a million dollars, what does it say to like ask for that amount of money, especially in the 70s when it was written? But never mind now, like what does that do to, to sort of change it? Um, uh, I think about like, everyone's a mother here in Italy. What if it were, f I've met five or six mothers here in Italy versus everyone's a mother here, every person I see. And what does that do for me? There's something really, really interesting about what if we change the words to literally the opposite and, uh, and that shows us how much more important it is to say the thing that we're actually saying. Does that kind of make sense? Um, how to succeed comes to mind. This book is all that I need from the opening. Uh, I think about like, what if it were, this book is one of the seven or eight things that I'll, that I'll need versus this book is all that I need. It, it activates it in a really different way. And I just sort of make that stuff up with my students or with actors that I work with all the time in, in any sort of song. I might look for a line and say, imagine that you had to say this instead. Okay, now say it the first way. Um, it's sort of an interesting just exercise to sort of dig out one, one of those levels, yeah? This sounds so silly, but it's really important to me. The, I, I, I want to always stress that sentences sound like sentences, which is a silly thing to say and a silly thing to think about. But um, I, 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 I harp on it all the time. It's really important always that when we're singing something, it sounds like speech or it sounds like speech with notes or it sounds like, like it could be plain old text. Um, Sometimes this isn't achievable if it's a really specific choral moment or a really particular riffy moment, and those things happen. But it's important that we approach it from a sentence structure place. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a great example in Hamilton. Sometimes might say, uh, uh, oh my God, it's been so long since I've done Hamilton. How does it go? Uh, death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes. There's actually a period there. Death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. New sentence, 
it takes and it takes and it takes. And I always say to somebody playing Burr, I want to hear death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes that there's a new thing, that there's a, a new activation of a sentence. It's also important to me, so, so punctuation is really useful. Even if it's not written in the score for whatever reason, we can add our own and we can make sure that it's, that it's clear where the sentences happen. I also want to make sure that words sound like words. My number one, I think, pet peeve as a music director, I guess there are many pet peeves, but the first one I'm gonna talk about here has to do with um, the word nation and things that rhyme with the word nation. Elation, vacation, frustration. Why? Because more often than not, actors and singers wanna say nation and vacation because it, sound, it feels much better to sing. Um, every Aaron Burr I've ever met sings, you will come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. And every time we talk about it, I don't want to say every, but a lot of them. Uh, we'll come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you if we lay a strong enough foundation. It, it, uh, it's important to me that it sounds like nation and foundation because those are the words as opposed to nation. No one says nation, right? Um, another great example from Hamilton is, uh, uh, is about the emphasis of where where the um, uh, oh my god the emphasis on the right syllable you know how we make sure that the words sound like they sound in language in second act of Hamilton um, Jefferson says this prick is asking for someone to bring into task what often happens is a Jefferson might go this prick is asking for someone to bring into task and to really emphasize four because it's on the downbeat three four this prick is asking for someone to bring into task. And often the direction will be, we shouldn't accent the word for just because it's on the downbeat. We wanna hear, this prick is asking for someone to bring into task. This prick is asking for someone to bring into task. We sort of have to like actively swallow it. Um, things like that, right? Uh, uh, often I will hear dedicated to its service because K is on the, on the downbeat, but it should be dedicated to its service. You don't dedicate a book to me, you dedicate a book to me. So sometimes we have to take the words out of their context in order to sort of hear how they're supposed to go. Last thing I wanna say about this, and then I should move on, is that uh, I, I try to specify the color and the tone of a, of a lyric or a, of a sound whenever possible. So it's not just about what we're saying and why we're saying it, but what is it supposed to sound like? What is it supposed to feel like? And that could be true in ensemble singing, it's true often in ensemble singing. Some of my favorite music directions in Hamilton from, from Alex Lacamoire have to do with, this should feel breathless, or this should feel really bouncy, and this should, this should have a lot of electricity in it, which is, you know, you'll notice none of those sound like forte or staccato. They're descriptive and they're activated, right? Um, and and that, that's really useful. One of my favorite uh, things I've ever heard from, from the music director, Kevin Stites, we were doing the show Titanic and he, he uh, there's this great A minor waltz at the end of act one. And he says to the cast, this should feel like you're swirling a glass of red wine in your hand, which is just like the coolest thing, chills everywhere. And of course it really affects the way you sound. Uh, and again, there's no specific musical term to it, but it really activates and really specifies the way we're all trying to sing together. So that's really useful. Are there, let me scroll and see if there's like a couple of little questions that I can grab before we move on to, to part two, but I'm mindful of, of keeping my eye on the clock here. Pardon me while I scroll, just a small amount. Um, yeah, I would say this does apply a little bit to more legit singing for sure. I don't, um, I don't specify, I don't pretend to be any sort of operatic expert whatsoever. I know truly, honestly, very little about that world, but I would still use something like this in a legit musical theater way. Um, the, 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 the best example I could think of while I'm in Titanic mode, and there's another Maury Eston show called Death Takes a Holiday. And there's a great, great, uh, great line. Uh, uh, somehow I know that the world's more enormous than I dreamed it would ever be. The word dreamed, no matter what style you're singing in or dreams is an amazing word to sing. Just because of dr that goes around it, you can really chew it. Uh, the world's more enormous than I dreamed it would ever be. I mean, my goodness, that's seven R's in that word. Then I dreamed um, something you can really land on. I don't feel like it has to be something belty for these principles to apply um, and for really activating where the emphasis is supposed to go. Maybe I answered that question, Mary. I hope so. Um, what else can I 
what, what else can I get? The value is, is getting the kids to experiment. That's exactly right. And I think it's useful to show that there are many different ways to sing one line that might be nice to do. Like, here's five ways to sing this line uh, so that they show that the, that there are always a few options. What else can I get? Uh, I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. Do I ever print off lyrics and have students work from that? Absolutely. And we'll get to that in just a second. But I think that's useful, especially if your kids aren't music readers. Um, it's useful to have something to uh, uh, to show, to, just to like work from. And if, especially because I use the word underline so much, I feel like when I say to an actor, hey, can you underline this word? Then they can literally do it uh, on their score or in their script or whatever the lyric sheet might be. Um, for sure, I absolutely do it that way. C could be that we circle the operative words or we, cir or we like draw an arrow and write in what the opposite word meaning might be. Um, that sort of thing. This is a great question from, from, from Wesley here uh, about uh, any tips on helping students br break from the versions they know, because a lot of the times we listen to the cast album. This is a really, really good question. Well, I could do this and just get above the banner that way. That's okay. You could put it there. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think part of the challenge might be the directive to say, you know, use the album and love the album and listen to the album. That's really, really great. And now show me five ways to sing this line that are different from the album. And maybe you don't have to specify what the album is, but hey, choose three lines or maybe one verse or one chorus or whatever it might be and show me three different ways or however many different ways to sing it that are entirely different or that are emphasizing different words than they do on the album. And that forces them to listen to like, what's so good about the album and what is the word that they're doing? And maybe that's the best way, but maybe there's a different way. That's one idea. Okay, I'm gonna hold on to those questions and maybe I'll come back to them in a little while, but I wanna move on if I may to sort of part B, which is another sort of uh, uh, exercise that we might look at for how to learn a song at home. And this has to do with form. Um, we all, uh, uh, many of us, if, if we went to music school or if we went to theater school, we all know form and we all know that like learning the form of a song is important. Um, and what I like about this idea is, uh, is the idea that, especially in pop songs, we think verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, what's so hard about that? Um, but what's kind of interesting is that this is an exercise I want to do with you that, that sort of forces us to take a little bit more of a granular approach, which is kind of nice. I stole this lesson from my dear friend, Travis Cross, who's a wind ensemble director at UCLA. And the reason I mentioned that is that this method is really originally sort of used to study orchestral scores or symphonic scores. But what's cool is that when he teaches it, he actually uses a song from Newsies to teach this method to his... Uh, to, to orchestral students and conducting students. So it can be used for anything and kind of, and true, true to form can be used here in musicals as well. Um, and like I say, it can be really useful to sort of think about form from the inside out, as opposed to, I hear a verse, I hear a chorus, I hear a verse, I hear a chorus. Um, this can be done with music, like I'm gonna do right now, or it can be done with lyric sheets. If your students are, aren't lyric readers or just by listening could be a fun exercise, whatever it is. So I'm gonna do this a little bit, brevity and a little bit sped up and fast because of just the time that we have, but walk with me. I wanted to use the song You'll Be Back from the hit musical Hamilton on Broadway and around the world. We'll see if I still remember it, <laughs> given that it's been a few weeks, but here's what it is. Um, I've got my music here, and the idea is that we want to play through and just note the sections as they happen. Just observe when we get a new phrase, really, not even a section, but to note a new phrase when it happens. Um, so, for instance, he says, you, uh, the King of England will sing. You say, the price of my love's not a price that you're willing to pay. Good. That's one phrase. So I'm going to take my pencil. I'm going to mark that phrase just on my music with the letter A. You cry in your tea, which you hurl in the sea when you see me go by. Basically the same phrase. A couple little differences there, but it's the same melody, essentially the same uh, harmonic structure. So I'm going to mark that again with an A. Admission, I've already marked up my music, so I'm putting my pencil down. But in theory, we do this together, right? Next thing, he says, why so sad? This is new, so I'm gonna mark this with B. Remember we made an arrangement when you went away. Now you're making me mad. Remember despite our estrangement, I'm your man. In theory, we could mark that B as well because it's kind of the same thing, but I'm choosing to mark it with a C because it's a little different. So, so far we have A, A, B, and C. We're not trying at all to get a sense of, oh, this must be the intro. 
We're not trying to think about sections at all yet. Um, and uh, it's really just noticing where the phrases are and where the phrases change or stay the same. Um, and by the way, if you do or don't read music, like, like I say, this can be done just with a lyric sheet or even just by listening to the song and keeping track of the, of the, of the phrases as they go by. Okay, good. So we've so far got, got my sections up to now. And now he might sing, you'll be back. So this is something new entirely. So I might write letter D here. Again, I'm just putting in sequential letters just to notice this is new material. So here we go. You'll be back, soon you'll see. You'll remember you belong to me. You'll be back, time will tell. So I might have called that D, and now we have D again. You'll remember that I served you well. Oceans rise. This is new. I might call this E. Empires fall, we have seen each other through it all. And when push comes to shove, this is new, I'm gonna call this F. I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love, da 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 da. And this is new, so I'm gonna call this G. So I'm just marking up my little phrases as they go. Again, I'm not thinking, ooh, this must be the chorus. I'm just thinking this is new material. Ooh, G again. You say our love is draining. And this is new. So I'm going to call this H blah, 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 all the way through. So now, I'm just skipping ahead a little bit for the sake of time, but later on he might go, ever and ever and ever, you'll be back like before. Ah, this is familiar. We had a version of this early on, different words, but it's the same melody, same structure. So I'm gonna refer back to earlier and that's letter D again. Making some sense? So even though we've had other letters, it, I'm not calling it the chorus, I'm not calling it the verse, it's just D. So we've done that for the whole song. Now I'm skipping ahead a little bit just for time. So now I'm gonna take my, now we're getting artsy. I went to music school. Blank piece of paper, you'll be back. And now I'm gonna start to is listing my sections. A, A, B, C, just like this, just in order, right? Whatever I did next, D, D, all the way and all the way down, I'm gonna list the sections as they appear in order in my music. Skipping ahead a little bit. This is like a cooking show where I like, I made my meatloaf and now I put the meatloaf in the oven. Now 45 minutes later, here it is. I've never made meatloaf, but I imagine it's much like this. So here's, here's my completed list of all the sections in a row. I hope you can see this okay. Um, but all it is is just the names of the letters as they appear. Cool? So coming over here so we can sort of see this together. And now all we sort of try to do is notice where the patterns are. Right, I'm not, again, not trying to label yet verse, chorus, verse, chorus, but I might say, okay, first thing we notice is that there's a lot of repetition. I'm trying to do this backwards. A, A, D, D, G, G, D, D, G, G. Oh, so that's kind of interesting. So maybe I'll draw a little thing. We like these as phrase marks if you went to music school. D, D, G, G, D, D, H, H, G, G, U, and G, G again. Ooh, very interesting. It's cool. So now, thank you, we call that a swap out, well done. Uh, so now, we notice a couple of different patterns, right? There's a repeated thing and then a couple of new things. There's a repeated thing and then a couple of new things. So that might be a pattern like this, a larger thing so-and-so. And the patterns sort of start to emerge this way. And like that, just automatically, the sort of the form almost starts to reveal itself. We sort of know now that this I might call real letter A, which we might label later on as the intro. This we might call real letter B, which might be, we now know, the verse. You will be back, right? Or I guess you would call it the first chorus. And then letter G we now know is the da-da-das, or whatever the chorus might be. A, B, C, D, E, and then C and C again. And now the form sort of starts to reveal itself to us. Oh, this is a really good question, I'll, Kate, and Katie, I'll come to it in a second. So now the form starts to reveal itself, which is great. And again, the song, as we all know from Hamilton, is not super duper complicated in terms of its form. But what's kind of interesting is we can start to look at what the patterns are and what the differences are. For instance, look at the difference between B and E. They go D, D, E, F, D, D, L, M. So now, what's the difference between those two things in the song? Where, uh, the sections that we labeled as D, D, E, F, D, D, L, M, 
what might link them lyrically and musically and what might make them different and why do you think that is? We can talk about what might change in the, in the song from an orchestration standpoint. Do we notice that, for instance, I happen to know that the first D, D, E, F, we hear basically just harpsichord at the beginning. And then when we get to D, D, L, M, it's just pizzicato strings. And why, what, why might we make that choice? And what can we grab as an actor that might say, ooh, it's the pit strings, and how might that uh, change my approach? How might that uh, uh, change the way I attack that section? Um, so, so what that does is it shows us specifically what's the same and what's different about the choruses and verses and why it might uh, encourage us to think about that in that way. Um, so Katie's question is a really good one. Um, yeah, uh, wondering how to do this with a full class of students. Uh, so this is this is a really, really good question. And Katie, I'm I'm wondering if you're if you're thinking particularly about this form exercise or about the earlier thing about lyrics and I'll sort of approach both. Um, you sort of read my mind a little bit about where I'm going with it, is that, um, of course, it is really, really hard to have people sing as a group and perform as a group. There are a couple of different technology that we know about, like the acapella app a little bit allows us to sort of build on each other when singing, but it's, it's tough to do in a teaching setting. And so what I might recommend with something like this form exercise is maybe you, the teacher, demonstrate it just the way I did, going maybe <laughs> in real time instead of skipping ahead and sort of demonstrate how we might do that with a song and uh, and then assign all of your students to do a song and report back. What do they learn about the form? What do they learn about how that might change the singing? Do they notice about the illustration? What do they notice about the way the lyrics change from section B, section B? That is to say, we had D, D, E, F versus D, D, L, M. How do the lyrics change? How do how how does this the the intensity of the song change? Whatever that might be, and maybe then they perform the song for us with that knowledge. Maybe it's that uh, everybody in the class has a different song by the same composer to work on, or maybe they work in teams or whatever it might be. Um, and then, uh, may, or maybe if you were going to do a spring musical at school, maybe everybody in the class has a song from that musical. Um, this, by the way, is also really valuable, even if they're an ensemble person. What did they have to sing as an ensemble member? And uh, and why is that important? And why should that be active? Uh, listening through the layers. I love that. Um, cool. I've got a, time for another question or two. Um, what can I do? Do I have any programs, apps that allow people to rehearse remotely without the lag between performers? That's really, really tough. The short answer is is no, not yet. Um, like I say, the acapella app a little bit is I have never I have no experience with, but some of my teacher friends have told me a little bit about that they've tried to experiment with. I think um, I have uh, heard a little bit of of success with, uh, for instance, people singing duets remotely um, if they both have a accompaniment track that they can sort of listen to. Um, but that's really, really tough to do these days. I feel like that technology is probably forthcoming from someone smarter than me. I feel like what is maybe help safest is maybe not the right word, but probably the best investment of our time right now is about singing alone or singing in pairs. And how can we make that the best experience possible? I was thinking this morning too, if you've got a student who's really comfortable in GarageBand or uh, is really comfortable making tracks, maybe they can record themselves and sing all of the harmony parts themselves for one thing. And maybe they, they'd have to harmonize with themselves, with themselves, with his or herself, um, uh, English. Uh, and maybe that's a really good listening exercise. Um, it, getting people to perform and sing as a group is not something I really have an answer for, which is part of why I said I'm really not sure at the beginning of all of this. But hopefully this is a couple of thoughts about what we can do uh, individually and then report back and sort of perform for each other as opposed to trying to do as a large group. Um, can maybe take one more question. What can I grab? I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Still scrolling. This is all great. Yeah, this, that's all very, very helpful. I think it, it like like uh like the last question. Ooh. 
ask. Yeah, I would say the most, this is a really, really good question. I think I, I want to wrap with this. The most essential learning experience for our kids, I think, is going to really uh, depend on you and our, and who your kids are. I think it is hard for me to answer because I don't know you and I don't know your kids, but you know your kids, which is really, really valuable. And you know where you were in the school year and in your, uh, oh no, the video just froze. Sorry, Amanda. I hope that's just for Amanda. Um, you know where you were in your curriculum when this all happened and where what your students are doing. And so I would ask you to sort of double down on what you wish your kids could could learn or what you wish your kids could could have finished the year with. And I would also ask you to double down on uh, what would, you know, given that we don't have the opportunity to get together and make music collectively, and given that we're not able to sing as a group, what are the things we can do? Uh, what are the things that, that we can make the most out of uh, uh, this kind of now limited style of instruction? And that might be something very different for one group of students versus another group of students. Um, we're, we're all going to sort of like figure this out a little bit together. And so what I would encourage is to sort of very much experiment and to ask your students what ideas they have as well, because they're experiencing this for the first time, just like you are. Um, and so if you have a student that is willing to sort of sit with GarageBand and make an accompaniment back for a student, that's great. And maybe that's really useful for that student to sort of like get some GarageBand skills in this time or whatever that might be. Um, we're all sort of making this up and thinking outside the box, but I don't think there's a wrong answer yet in terms of what is or isn't useful material uh, or is not a useful experience for your students. Um, hey. Oh, there's Pam. Yay. Hi, Pam. Thank you so much for doing this. I feel like you had so many amazing ideas that, you know, even though it's hard for everybody to sing together, so many great ways for the students to go out individually and work on some of these exercises and come back and share. And I'm sure just by watching what someone else came up with, it's going to inform that student's idea of what the other possibilities are. And, and hopefully all those things can build on each other as, as they're working from home. So a, a fantastic job. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me, Pam. It's been such a blast. And thank you all for, for tuning in and for giving me a, 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 an outlet to come and share some, some thoughts with you and for watching from all over the world and for your thoughts. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, you are the best. Well, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we will see you again soon. Yes, I think I, I'm hoping to see you all this summer at the Broadway Teachers Workshop. Exactly. Is that, is that... This is just a sort of a taste, a sampling of what's in store. So uh, hopefully right. you can you, you can come and, and watch me talk for you know, God knows how long. <laughs> Excellent. Will do. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Take care.